Chapter 6 Corey cried out and spun out of the man's grasp. The man looked more startled than Corey. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. Corey stared at him, gasping for breath, his muscles tense for a fight or for a fast escape. He was a tall, powerful-looking man wearing a faded gray slicker and a battered old tennis hat. He had a day's stubble of gray beard and he smelled of cigarette smoke. No need to be frightened, he said. He had a high-pitched voice for someone so big. Why... why'd you... Corey was still too out of breath to talk. He backed up another few steps, relaxing a little, but still eyeing the man warily. I saw you stop your car, the man said, pointing back in the direction of Corey's car. I lived down the street. I was walking Voltaire. That's my dog. I thought maybe you were lost or in trouble, so I came after you. Where is your dog? Corey asked suspiciously. The man frowned, seemingly annoyed by Corey's mistrust. Voltaire doesn't like strangers, he said slowly. He's very protective of his turf. I put him back in the house before I came to see if you needed help. Corey was beginning to breathe normally again, but he knew he couldn't wax his guard. There was something strange about this neighbor, not just his appearance, but in his menacing stare, the way he kept looking Corey up and down, his face tight, expressionless. Car breakdown? The man asked. No, Corey said. Then what are you doing out here? You lost? Not exactly. I was looking for the Corwins. You found them, the man said, gesturing with his head toward the dark house. You know them? Well, not really. They're strange people. I wouldn't go up there uninvited, I don't think. The man scratched at his stubble. What do you mean? Corey shivered. He never felt so chilled in his life. Just that. Oh. They stood staring at each other for a long moment. They keep to themselves mostly, the man said. He put his hands in his sucker pocket and turned back toward the street. If you're not lost or anything, I guess I'll head back. Yes, I mean, no, I I'm fine. Thanks, Corey said uncertainly. He looked up to the Corwin house, a light flicker on in an upstairs window. So, someone was home after all. They're pretty strange folks, the man repeated, walking quickly now. He turned around. Of course, everyone's pretty strange on Fear Street. <laughs> he chuckled as if he just made a really good joke and slipped off into the darkness. Curry waited to make sure the man was really gone. Then he turned and headed slowly toward the car. He stopped and looked back to the house. The light was still on in the second floor room. Should he go up and knock on the door? He'd come this far. Why not be brave? Why not just do it? Act now? Think later. Why did he always have to go back and forth, think things out so carefully before he acted? Besides, he'd have something to tell David about later. He imagined how his friend would make fun of him if he told him he just stood there at the end of the drive and stared at the house. He'd probably hear about it for weeks. The jokes would never stop. Okay, Corey. Go for it. He began jogging up the Corwin's driveway. He jogged partly to get warm, partly because he knew he'd never go through without if he didn't do it quickly. A gymnast learns he has to be aggressive, he told himself. He has to grab on the rings and push himself where he probably normally wouldn't go. As a gymnast, Corey was quick and short, but this wasn't gymnastics, this was life. He jumped up onto the front porch, dodged past the overturned chair, slid on some long carpeting nails that were scattered over the porch floor, and nearly crashed right into the front door. He steadied himself, leaning against the shingle front of the house, located the doorbell, and without hesitating, without giving himself a chance to back down, pushed it hard. He didn't hear it ring inside the house. He pushed it again. He straightened his sweatshirt and pushed back his hair with one hand. The bell didn't make a sound. It must be broken. He knocked, lightly at first, then harder. Silence. He cleared his throat, practiced a smile. He knocked again. This time he heard footsteps, someone hurrying down the stairway. The door opened a crack. No light poured out. The house was dark inside. An eye stared out at Corey. The door opened a little wider. Two eyes stared suspiciously out. The porch light flickered on, casting a pale yellow glow on the porch in the front lawn. 
A young man stood in the doorway. He had a very round face with puffy round cheeks. His blue eyes were small and watery, except close to his bulby round nose. Despite the fact he appeared to be quite young, in his early twenties most likely, his blonde hair was thinning, revealing a lot of forehead. It was tossed massively over his head. A rhinestone earring sparkled in one ear. He stared at Corey for a long time without saying anything. Corey stared back uncomfortably. Finally, he said, Hi, I'm Corey Brooks. Is Anna home? The young man's watery eyes grew wide. His mouth twitched once in surprise. Anna? What do you know about Anna? His voice was raspy, as if he had a bad sore throat. I, uh, I go to Shadyside too. Shadyside? What Shadyside? The young man said, then coughed for a long time, holding tightly onto the front door. A wheezing smoker's cough. It's the high school, Corey said when the young man finally stopped coughing. I met Anna in school this week, and that's impossible, the man interrupted, hitting the door frame with his fist. He glared at Corey. His eyes seemed to glow right in the porch light. No, really, I... You didn't meet Anna in school. Anna isn't in school. Yes, she is, Corey insisted. She... You're the one who called? Well, yes, I... Anna is dead, young man rasped. Don't come here again. Anna is dead.